And I think the ambassador uh, said something about this, but uh, this is a fundamental, uh, in my opinion, a very difficult question. Uh, put an emphasis on fighting organized crime or on drugs. And I think there is a trade-off only at the early stages of drug trafficking. At the early stages, uh, you can say organized crime and drug trafficking are different activities. But at some point, after a few years, with this criminal organization involved in the trafficking, became so powerful and became, become a threat to the state that it's very difficult to say that you're fighting only the drug trade and you're not fighting organized crime. And this idea, maybe Daniel has something to say about this, of Mark Heyman, for example, that which will target it only the most violent cartels, in my opinion, is very difficult to put in practice to implement. So at some point in the state that is in Mexico, what we lived through in Colombia in the late 1980s and 1990s, we didn't have any option. It was almost impossible for a policy maker saying, if we gave him a piece of advice at that time saying, you know why, you should focus on organized crime, forget about the top trade. What does that mean? Anything, in my opinion. So this is a complicated issue because I think the government of Mexico and the same happened in Colombia 10, 15 years ago. Don't have, or well, doesn't have any choice now, but putting emphasis in fighting of organized crime, and this is very much the same as pursuing the main uh, drug trafficking in the sector. I don't know if Daniel... Thank you. Why don't we take another question, and maybe, maybe if we have some time, Daniel... I didn't answer the question because I think it's impossible. It's very, very difficult to sort of give a straight answer about what harm reduction means in a country in, like Colombia, uh, but well, my short answer is doesn't mean much. Baroness Mitch. Um, I Mexico recently um, at a meeting with people dealing with the security issues in Mexico. Um, I was struck by their explanation of the problems they're facing as twofold, essentially. I'm sure there are more, but two. Um, one level of education of large numbers of people, a very low level of education, and therefore the temptation for large numbers of people to go into uh, drug dealing. And the second was the level of pay of local police, that the security fighters, if you like, can deal with it at a national level, but very, very difficult at a local level, when the police are just needing to make up their salaries by <laughs> getting some money from the, the, the drug barons. And I just wonder, was this a similar picture in Colombia, forgive my ignorance, I ought to know this, but I don't. Um, and if, so, if there was an element of either of those two factors, how long did it take you to, to deal with that? So that's my question. Can I very quickly make a point, mainly to say congratulations to Guatemala and to uh, Colombia for the amazing initiative, which just is absolutely uh, stunning, I think. And I, I, the reason I was late tonight is I was coming back from Brussels because I was asked if I would do something in Europe. Uh, to parallel what is going on in Latin America. And I had an amazing uh, response from countries in Europe and indeed some of the institutions within the EU. So we are now going to work hard to try and support what you are doing. I just want Thank to get that. Daniel? Mm, I just want to say one thing before answering the question. Your questions. It's some, something about this balloon effect. Um, there is something that worries me, and I would call it this way the strategic balloon effect. Oh, I'm going to say a little what I mean by that. Jorge Castaneda was a um, foreign secretary. Uh, secretary of Mexico. And I read, uh, I think, two or three years ago, this. An interview, I think, was published in the New York Times at that point, saying something like this, that the United States made a big mistake uh, 10, 15 years ago when decided to put an emphasis 
in, in the Caribbean uh, routes. So drug trafficking became, well, the Pacific became sort of the essence of the main route of trafficking, and Mexico then became involved or heavily involved in the business. The Minister of Defense of Colombia, I think, has said many times, he said it uh, last week at the University of Los Angeles, that the main objective of Colombian policy is that the business, the business of producing cocaine, or maybe the business of exporting cocaine, becomes less competitive in Colombia than in other countries of the world. So we talk a lot about cooperation in, in, in the region, but, but now we have, or we may have, this crazy thing about the countries with internal policies trying to export that power. And I think that will become an issue in the region. So my, many people may say that the good experience of Colombia that we are sort of celebrating tonight, what happened in the last two years, is going to be an example of many countries. And many of us are going to try to do the same thing. But for the region as a whole, that would be a type of crazy thing. And I think this is an important issue that we must discuss tonight. Because cooperation is very easy to say we are cooperating. But in practice, we may be doing the opposite. Um, it's like that. You, you, you say something about education. education. <coughs> you are right about education. And, and if you compare the average in year schooling in Colombia and Mexico and, for example, in Brazil, they are very much the same. And it's very difficult to say that this has nothing to do with this problem. In rough areas of Colombia, it's very easy to get food soil for their business. And they don't, not, not only they don't have a good education, they don't have many good uh, job opportunities. But, uh, then we have a puzzle. This is a problem that is shared by almost all countries in Latin America. And why then Colombia and not Brazil, for example? Although in Brazil you have a real decent type of thing, but why not Peru and Ecuador? I'm waiting until we solve the education problem, it's going to be too late. And I want to say something about Mexico. And I think Mexico is, is getting. There is now this thing about Brazil and Mexico competing for the economic premiums in the region, and really for Mexico. <laughs> uh, uh, Mexico has been very innovative in terms of social policy and education. And one might say that what Brazil did was just copy what Mexico did to years ago. And Brazil, for some reason, gets the good price. And Mex Mexico doesn't get full credit for what it uh, the country's been doing. This just to make this point. In Latin America, we haven't forgotten the issue of education, health, and social policy. Social expanded as a percentage of GDP in the region as a whole doubled in the last 15 years. The problem that the challenge is huge. And despite that fact, despite all the fiscal efforts, the problems are still, many of the problems are still unresolved. Thank you. Other questions? Well, uh, my name is uh, Dao Dazaki. I work for the BBC World Service. I'm also a visiting scholar at the University of London. And uh, drugs is my PhD topic. I'm comparing Afghanistan with Colombia. Uh, my question is about alternative uh, livelihood and alternative crops because for farmers it's always about money. Um, we see in the survey in Afghanistan, around 90% of farmers say that they cultivate opium poppies because uh, it's more expensive than other traditional crops. Uh, and you also mentioned that uh, legitimate crops. Uh, what can replace uh, coca? in Colombia and uh, in 
another Latin American countries because in Afghanistan there hasn't been any crop, uh, legitimate, so called legitimate crop which can replace opium. Uh, the, the price difference is uh, 1 to 11 and 1 to 10. Uh, saffron has been uh, cultivated in some parts of Afghanistan now, but they cannot compete with, uh, uh, with opium. So, what is the replacement? Okay, so there is no crop that you can find that the magical crop that you can replace copper with. What the experience of Colombia shows is that uh, these alternative development programs look great in theory, uh, but when they are implemented, they are very poorly implemented. I mean, if you go to a region in Colombia, in the south west border with Ecuador, for instance, and throw money to farmers, so they switch to coca, 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 and that doesn't work. And you leave the farmers alone and they don't have the means to transport the, the legal product into the market, that fails completely. And a lot of money has been wasted on those products. However, there has been a program, and Daniel Rinko, who is one of the co-authors of the book, knows this well. Um, the Macarena Integral Consolidation Plan was uh, an alternative uh, approach to drug policy implemented in Colombia about three, four years ago, where they basically didn't only throw money into the regions, but they also came with all, the, all state institutions, education, health, judicial system, more police, more, er more manual eradication, etc. And that has uh, been shown to work a lot. I mean, in the Macarena region, you see a decrease in cover cultivation, a decrease in the homicide rate, an increase in the, in the trust in the police, in the judicial system. So any alternative lightning program should be implemented together with other programs. Otherwise, it's a complete waste, complete waste of money. They do great, great in theory, but when implemented, they, are, uh, they might fail. Thank you. One last question, the same place. Yes. 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 Ambassador Francisco. Yeah. Go ahead. Now. There is a mystery going on in Colombia now and has to do with the production of the coca fields, the coca acres that went from 100,000 hectares to 60 something. I don't know if Daniel knows the last number, it is 55, 50, 50, 55,000 hectares. Um, and we don't know why, and nobody knows why. And I have a theory, pet theory, Dutch disease. Uh, when this booming mining and oil sectors in Colombia, many workers are moving to those sectors and are finding sort of profitable opportunities. And in Colombia, we have now that the cost of production is also going down. And in that sector, everybody is saying, you know, it's Dutch disease. But I think something similar is also going on in some regions. Not in all. But for example, in the Magdalena Medellin with the coca production. So the alternative development programs, they don't work very well. But if we have profitable opportunities in other sectors in the economy, maybe that we, that would be a sort of unintended way to substitute the coca production for other legal activities. Okay, last two questions, uh, Luis and the uh, ambassador assistant from Guatemala. Thank you. Um, well, I, I want to just say thank you very much. I think it's really um, very positive that Colombia and Mexico are leading this discussion. Um, I wanted to kind of build a little bit on the last question because it was interesting this first speaker talked quite a lot about um, transportation and distribution of the drugs internationally. But of course, you need also for the problems to focus a little bit on what's happening in Colombia, particularly with the levels of poverty in Colombia. And um, cultivation and transportation are two major issues, which I think you were just referring to in the last example, whereby uh, cocaine is obviously easily cultivated, easily replaced, even when sprayed, and, and easily transported as well. So there's, there are some issues around what kinds of programs are going to be able to be implemented for those who are in poverty in Colombia, because otherwise you're just going to find that um, this, this continues, really. Um, 
So that this is one area that I, I kind of appreciate if you could talk a bit more widely about how, how what kind of plans you have for tackling those levels of poverty um, and how the kind of lack of infrastructure uh, comes into play in that, in that sense. And the other is that the drugs have always fueled the conflict in, in Colombia that, that's continuing with the guerrilla and the paramilitaries and now um, the, the backroom that, um, uh, that exists. And according to the um, monitoring of the peace process by the Organization of American States, and they were looking at uh, the continuation of the paramilitaries in the form of backroom. They were talking about the fact that many of these illegal groups were either more focused on drugs as a, as a key motivating factor and others more fo focused on um, the politics of the, of the paramilitaries, the previous politics of the paramilitaries. So I was just wondering how Colombia was thinking about tackling these issues as well that are quite, quite internal. Really. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to make a uh, comment. It's, it's really great to have three Latin American ambassadors. And, uh, to answer Luis's uh, question, right? No, no, no. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, no, because we, we need to answer the question. Okay. And then if you want to make a comment, sure. that's fine. I don't, I don't want let's, to let's answer Luis's uh, question. Uh, I can explain. <coughs> question to you. No, okay. well, I can, I can give a, an answer as well, but, uh, but let's uh, no, hear what, you, what the scholars uh, have to say about this. <laughs> You have, in essence, two questions. The first one is about poverty. And, you know, the cultivation at the beginning wasn't an issue. Uh, when Colombia became the main exporter of cocaine to the, to the United States, coca was not cultivated in, in Colombia, it was cultivated in Peru and Bolivia. And the drug traffickers at the time used to go to these countries to buy the base and pasta. And, Take it to Colombia, processing the cocaine to cocaine and export this stuff to the United States. Uh, poverty is an issue, but I, what I want to emphasize is that poverty, but the reduction of poverty is a separated issue. We have many, many reasons to focus on the reduction of poverty in our country. And maybe this has a positive consequence, and this is going to reduce the economic incentives to many people to get into the business. But that's not the main reason for me to focus on the reduction of poverty. And you are right, if you look at the geography of poverty and illicit sort of uh, coca fields, is they're up, they overlap. You have more poverty in the provinces or around where there is uh, more uh, coca fields. But um, linking the two things in sort of a deterministic way, saying as long as you have poverty, you are going to have this problem, I think it's not right. And, and we have done many studies on this, sort of, for example, looking at the connection between violence and poverty in Colombia, and that one is not as close. Then you have this complicated issue about the primary targets, huh? trying to disentangle them between organizations that focus on the drug business, and some organizations that primary targets the drug or whatever, that sort of are more in the political sort of type of business. I don't think that is. You're going to have, in many many cases, the primary target organization doing both things, and that one is complicated. Benefit from the drug business and using that money to sort of buy and have political influence in many regions of the continent. So I don't think, in general, we can sort of disentangle these criminal organizations in saying we have a political one here and we have a just uh, economic motivated one you know, the region. I think in general they have this type of double personality to put it that Ambassador Francisco. Last question. 
Yes. Well, one that is not an expert, I would say, we only know what I do, not to go all the way what Colombia has to suffer. And we would like to have to try to play Mexico in Korean institutions of the So uh, we understood President Pérez Molina understood that for us, drug trafficking is a national security problem. But it cannot be solved nationally. Yeah. And that's why the initiative of Pérez Molina uh, began last February. Uh, many other former presidents have, talked, have said many things. Uh, president Santos, a real president, spoke about it as the number in London. But maybe for the first time, a uh, real president, the last president, the president, said, well, we, we have to think. Think and not, and not be forbidden on these issues. And we have to speak about these issues. And the initiative is that. We have to speak, we have to think about it. I just want to do a, a, a question with this uh, allusion to the <coughs> Green Initiative. I would like to see the world uh, from now, from the next 10 years, 20 years, I don't know, maybe less. And uh, the best in this uh, Green Initiative <coughs> separates what is fighting against drugs and fight against narco traffic. And what Bernard Molina thinks is that what has really failed in the fight against drugs. And that fight hasn't has even begun. See that? The question is, do you think that maybe in the next years we would, we would uh, speak about the blessed cocaine, compared cocaine, with all other kind of drugs that are getting into the market. <coughs> and all the problems that these drugs will bring to uh, health for people. Do you think that uh, uh, cocaine in the next years is not going to be the problem? The problem is the problem with synthetic drugs. So you're right in saying that the cocaine consumption in the US has been decreasing? For instance, the average consumer of cocaine in the U.S. has been aging over time, and uh, like every drug, there is a life cycle. There is a life cycle of consumption where it initially increases very fast with the crack epidemic, and then it fades away. And the cocaine consumption epidemic in the U.S. is fading rapidly. In Spain, Ireland, the U.K., cocaine consumption is increasing, and the natural suppliers of this uh, are the Andean countries. So. I don't think in the next few years we're going to see a large decline in cocaine consumption. We're going to see it over a much longer period of time. Uh, let, me, let me interpret what President Molina says, and you're, you're correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think he, he mentioned the world legalization in, uh, in our view. I've, I've talked to President Gaviria about this, this point. Is that he mentioned the world legalization to attract attention, not because he really thinks that legalization is possible. But maybe mentioning words like decriminalization, people don't, don't understand this context. So he went all the way to, to legalization to attract attention. He, he actually got the attention. And then we can start the debate and make people think that, as you said. I think this, this is the crucial, uh, the crucial issue. Yeah. And your 30 second final. Yeah. <laughs> May I say one, one thing about legalization? Because Michael ask a question about this. And Daniel perhaps is a little bit more pessimistic about legalization, but, but I uh, we say only decriminalization. That doesn't need much for producer countries either. Uh, and in marijuana, for example, we're moving to legalization. For other drugs, it's much more difficult. But I don't know what, what we mean by, by legalization. As an economist, what I like to think is having a different type of regulation through taxes, for example. And if we put it that way, a different regulation to these markets, 
In that what we mean by legalization, I must say that unlike the concept, although the practical implications of, imp of implementing a policy like that are very complex and I would say even unknown. But maybe I don't agree with Daniel with this, ruling out legalization, saying that's an impossible objective without defining what we mean by this. Maybe it's not good for the debate. Um, because, once again, the example of marijuana, I think it's showing us that legalization is a feasible option. For cocaine, I don't know. But. Okay, um, that's all. Yeah. All night we're going to be talking about the importance of science and evidence to, to give this debate. I just want to highlight something that. I mean, much of the evidence we need, we don't have them. I mean, we, we can have this debate about Colombia. We have been working in established data and research for many years, and this I mean, provides information to, to, to bring this book. But if we want to write a similar book in other countries, we cannot make it. We don't have the information, we don't have the data, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the track of that. So it's really very important, and that's what I want to mention. I mean, we have a lot of representation of American, uh, Latin American ambassadors here to provide the resources to keep research in the area. Uh, just one example, you mentioned the importance of Bakrim. I mean, we know that the Bakrim in Colombia are... Bakrim are different. criminal bands. Yeah, it's, it's the, the acronym for criminal bands in Colombia. It's the next generation of, or, and the new generation of Colombian cartels. We know that the Bakrim are bringing coca paste from Peru and Bolivia to transform in Colombia to sport. I mean, we know that, but we don't know how much. 1%, 10%, we don't know what's going on. <laughs> can we know that? Yeah, sure. I mean, we can just get the sales of cocaine in our lab, study that, and say, Okay, this is how the market is moving, but we don't know that. So we are not making enough research, we only have two or four variables, and it's really important to keep funding the research and the analysis to provide more evidence that can be probably making. Thank you. Sorry for running late 15 minutes of your wine time, but uh, you are wearing the same amount of wine is available. So, <laughs> so I invite you to a glass of wine, but before Nina, I uh, I want to thank again uh, our Colombian scholars, Alejandro and, and Daniel, Professor Miguel, Professor Gaviria, thank uh, Virginia, and thank Ambassador Medina Mora, and all of you for your presence. Uh, I think that uh, we now have a very important book, in fact, two books that are, are an important, a significant contribution to the debate based on, on, uh, on evidence led by scientists, by experts, and that's what uh, I think we all want to. Uh, to uh, to happen in, in this discussion. We have a new uh, approaches, new uh, alternatives, a yeah, serious evaluation of the costs and benefits of all the options to see if we can uh, come up with a better alternative to deal with a problem that has been too costly for too long. So thank you very much for these wonderful contributions and we hope to continue uh, contributing to this debate and we welcome all of you that are interested in, in, in uh, passing your ideas, your suggestions, your, your uh, research to, uh, to this discussion. We at the Colombian Embassy will be uh, facilitating this, this process until we hopefully have a new model that is much, much better than the one that we have today. Thank you very much.